Killing Floor 2, a perfect simulation of the British daily experience. Get dressed, stab your neighbor, go to the store, get in a knife fight, grab a pint, colonize the known world, then attempt to exterminate the Irish for the third time this week. God save the queen. I, I mean king. As accurate as the game is to British lifestyle, it was actually developed by God-fearing red-blooded Americans, and they simply couldn't help themselves from putting guns into the game too. God bless America. Live out your fantasies of dual-wielding desert eagles without breaking every single bone in your hands at once. Secure your place on a government watch list with generous amounts of C4 or by using a homemade flamethrower. Strike down your enemies with a katana made of glorious Japanese steel folded over 1,000 times. Or blast into a crowd of zombies with the stoner LMG made of glorious American scrap metal folded over one times. All of these weapons and choices for the purpose of eviscerating these specimens, also called Zeds. There's a variety of Zeds to match the variety of player options, and I'm led to believe Tripwire based the Zeds on the regular residents of the British pubs that they visited in their research. First of all, almost everybody is bald, half of them want to grab you and the other half want to puke all over you. The women you see are either decrepit and loud or are sneaky and have alt-girl danger hair. There's also the football hooligans that charge at you with spiky gauntlets when they get butt mad. Classic British culture. The huge variety of classes, weapons, talents, and enemies are the bedrock foundation that makes the core of this game so solid. You can see above this foundation a few of the cracks that are supported by the core, a story that doesn't matter and is barely present, characters that are largely forgettable, no official Spongebob map, and a lack of communication from the developers. That being said, the foundational gameplay is so strong that I keep coming back to it again and again. Killing Floor 2 is the perfect horde shooter to play with friends. You should play it, and I want to tell you why. The goal of this game is to survive against the hordes of Zeds on a map of your choice, and to make as much money as possible. In survival mode, you'll fight through limited waves of enemies and kill a boss at the end to win the game. Or play endless mode and see how many waves you can last. Oh, what about versus mode? No, no thank you. Kill enemies as efficiently as possible and rack up the money. Invest your dosh wisely by buying a good weapon and some armor. Or give it to your teammates who provide the same return on investment as your average shitcoin. In between each wave of Zeds, there's a break to go to the trader and make sure everybody gets a heal up reach around. Don't worry, it's not gay if you get money for doing it. One of Killing Floor's special mechanics is Zed Time, which can be randomly triggered by anybody on the team just by killing an enemy. It slows down time for everyone. You can use it to line up some good headshots or look for an exit if you're about to be cornered. Pick a character before you start too. And uh, make sure you choose some good cosmetics. You can choose to play solo, but the game is really best experienced with multiple people. Get some friends together or join a server to get the true KF2 experience. After that, pick a map. Good amount of maps, mostly horror themed, like Evil Scientific Labs and Portland, Oregon. Though about half of them are community made because Tripwire forgot how to make non-holiday themed maps after the first few that came with the game. Finally, choose your class, called Perks in this game. Trying out different perks and their weapons is one of the most fun parts of the game, so I want to tell you all about each one. First up is the Berserker. Hi kids, do you like violence? Want to chase somebody down a dark alleyway in silence? With a knife! The Berserker is a great frontliner and can't be grabbed by clots, but his other role is as a money generator for frequent healing reach arounds, since he takes so much damage. Considering he also doesn't have to spend much on ammo with melee weapons, if he's feeling adventurous, he can fund his teammates with his excess earnings. With the Berserker's talents for tanking and speed, now you, too, can be that shady guy that every woman on a jog is scared to be around after 6pm. Ignore pain. Hit harder. Let nothing stop you from from catching up to her and tying her sleeves together. Commando is one of my favorites and my recommendation for new players for very personal reasons. When I was but a little boy, my family took me out to a farm for the American ritual of letting your son shoot World War II weaponry unsupervised. The moment I fired my first round, I was enamored with the spirit of George Washington, who transformed into a bald eagle and flew away and told me as he flew to play Commando in Killing Floor 2 many years later. I saluted as a single tear rolled down my face, so overcome with emotion that I nearly 
shot myself in the leg. Commando lets you fire all the weapons a young boy would want, and this time at Zed's instead of at your own limbs. Commando's trait calls out cloaked Zed's for the team, too, outlining invisible ones in red. This means stalkers, as well as one of the bosses, the Patriarch, can't sneak up on you. Let loose with an M16 grenade launcher attachment. Scar H, assault rifle. Stoner, light machine gun. SA-80, bullpup. Galashnikov, suck your blip! Time to really explode! You may think using homemade C4 on Zeds when you could simply shoot them is slightly unhinged, but you'll find it quite reasonable once you see a level 25 demo whip out the explosive Tommy gun during Zed time. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. That was so big it threw my aim off. <laughs> oh my god, I can't Damn, see. Man. Glad to hear it. Medic weapons have two functions, bullets and projectile healing syringes. Medic's existence on a team is questionable considering that several classes have cross-use with medic weapons. The healing SMG can be used by SWAT, the healing melee weapon by Berserker, the healing assault rifle by Commando, all with similar effectiveness. Some would say you should determine beforehand whether your team needs someone who does slightly less damage to give you all more healing. Do you need the extra healing because you're bad at dodging? Have you considered simply killing the Zeds faster and not getting hit? Huh, dumb dumb idiot? All I have to say is that a pocket heal slot wildly slurping on your health bar mid-fight is one of life's many pleasures. And also, yes, I'm bad at dodging. Do you have a god complex? Enjoying seeing Zeds writhe in pain? Thrive in hearing your teammates complain about missing headshots because the Zeds are writhing in pain, and you keep blinding their line of sight with a flamethrower? You're not a very nice person, are you? Firebug is an odd class. You can clean up small enemies with a flamethrower, but maybe not as efficiently compared to somebody with a machine gun. You can take out large targets with a microwave gun, but maybe not as efficiently compared to somebody with a sniper rifle. But goddammit, setting a group of zombies on fire with a flamethrower is just plain satisfying, and there's no getting around it. Yeehaw! Gunslingers are a sort of pseudo-sharpshooter. Slightly less stopping power than a sharpshooter, but with more flexibility in closer ranges. Gunslinger is all about dual wielding. Dual wield some revolvers, be the cowboy you always wanted to be. Or some magnum revolvers to match your magnum dong. Or dual wield four guns at once, because mommy never loved you enough to give you those four handguns, one for each year on your fourth birthday that you wanted so bad. <laughs> Professionals have standards. Be polite. Be efficient. Have a plan to kill everyone you meet. Ah! Sharpshooters are like snipers in any other game. You're either going to feel like a god when you one-shot a flushbound to save your teammate. Flushbound on me. Got it. Or you'll feel like the most useless sack of shit on the team because you repeatedly die to low-tier enemies that uh -oh. get in your personal space. The support specialist is a boomer who believes that Gunplay Pete with the super shotgun in Doom 2. The boomer's a tripwire and I believe them to be completely correct, which is why they gave support specialists the super -er super shotgun, the doom stick. Four barrels all at once, sacrificing all the bones in your dominant firing arm to obliterate all the organs in your target's body. He's got plenty of damage, but he also has an ammo backpack. Once per turn, everyone on the team can grab ammo from you. Support specialist also welds doors faster and better than everybody else, meaning you can take take advantage of door choke points more efficiently than other classes. Survivalist has no designated role on a team because Survivalist isn't a real class. Survivalist has general damage resistance and can use any class weapon, so it's what people choose when they want to dick around with a revolver and a shotgun while their team dies around them. Then they wonder why everyone leaves the server while they run around throwing medic grenades at the floor for an hour and a half. SWAT is all about SMGs. Your role as SWAT is to take care of clots and crawlers fast. You can be tanky and ungrabbable, or a speedy boy. Hip fire your bullet hose in the vague direction of anything that moves for best results. To most effectively play SWAT though, treat the Zeds like you would treat a Twitch streamer. <laughs> There's 18 common types of Zeds, and with so many of them coming at you, you'll need to know which ones are which. Here's a handy dandy guide to help you identify and prioritize them quickly on the battlefield. Keep in mind that this is a generalized guide based on my experience in all difficulties and not specific to each perk, so if you'd like to whine about it in the comments section, but I'll 
please god fast cause moderate danger also please verak play deep rock galactic is best you may do so now in low danger we have clots crawlers gore fasts and stalkers sometimes referred to as trash mobs clots of this tier come in three flavors righteous anger manlet unfinished by god and self-described mocap actor cokehead behavior they don't deal much damage but don't underestimate them clots will grab and immobilize you if they get in arm's reach of you and force you to look at them. Trapping your movement and disorienting your camera gives the large lad behind them a prime opportunity to slap you upside the head. Unlike other spider-like creatures that give me confused arousal, crawlers aren't sexy at all. Well, not to me anyway. There's probably somebody out there who likes them like that, but either way. Crawlers are fast and love to impede your movement below eye level where you aren't looking. Gorefasts want to gore you, are fast, and have bad dental. Stalkers are invisible, evasive, and kind of scare me, but kind of give me a boner at the same time. Look for the shimmer that reveals them briefly, or play commando to reveal them for your entire team. The moderate danger tier includes four elite enemies, which are stronger versions of other Zeds. These Zeds have a chance to spawn instead of their normal counterparts, and that chance is increased at higher difficulties. Rioters are elite clots that love escalating violence. They scream to empower all the Zeds around them while staying comfortably out of range. Like a guy that screams World Star while recording two homeless men fighting to the death in a public bathroom. World Star! <laughs> Elite crawlers leave a poisonous gas cloud when they die unless you headshot them. It was a hard decision, but I can say with some certainty that uh, these spiders aren't very sexy either. Gore fiends want to gore you, are fiends, and have even worse dental. The Quarter Pounder is a cheeseburger you can get from McDonald's for $3.79. It also might be a smaller version of a big boy we'll talk about later. The third tier is for enemies with ranged attacks. These enemies are not necessarily all always higher priority, especially when you have a few residents of the Queen in your face. But the sooner you're able to pick them off, the better. The Bloat is the first prioritized target you'll have to deal with in the early rounds, spawning alongside the otherwise exclusively clot-filled waves. He's big, he's bad, he's gonna puke and sneeze right into your open mouth if you don't lop his head off first. The Husk is a firebug player who decided to just be honest and upfront by officially joining the Zeds, shooting fireballs at his previous allies. Husk fireballs can be dodged with a good jump. Ironically, the only weapon husks are weak to is microwave damage, a damage type used primarily by firebug. Let me talk to the fellas in the audience for a second. Fellas. Guys. You ever listen to a woman talk before? Women be shopping, am I right, fellas? Women be talking and shopping and, uh, screaming and hurting your ears and, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Please help me, I'm so lonely. Edars are robots and don't mind getting their head blown off. Three types of robots. One shoots rockets, another shoots lasers, and another will try to trap you with a beam. Shoot it in the chest to blow it up. The final and most important enemy tier. The large lads. The big boys. If you don't shit yourself from hearing the noise they make when they spawn. <laughs> They'll shit yourself for you. Scrakes are the big boys with the chainsaws. Slow, but get too close and they'll flip out for a bit. Injure them enough and they'll flip out permanently, sprinting at you until one of you kills the other. Because they're initially slow, if you play it smart, you should be able to avoid engaging with a Scrake until you're ready. The Flesh Pound is an intimidating figure. Built like a brick shithouse, but with the brain of an attention deficit disorder zoomer. It's the only enemy in the game that will get bored and start raging after after you if you don't pay attention to it. It rages similarly to the Scrake via injury, but unlike the Scrake, the Flesh Pound will calm down after it gets the engagement it craves. There's five bosses to back up these enemies in Killing Floor 2. You'll face one of them at the end of survival mode, or one every five rounds in endless mode. First you got the Patriarch, the guy who made all the Zeds. Then the Matriarch. She's the Patriarch's daughter, not his wife, but don't worry about it. A bloat, but big. A flesh pound, but big. And a friendly German NASA scientist who I'm sure has never done anything wrong. There are four difficulties in Killing Floor 2. A big point in the game's favor for me is that it doesn't do what many other games do for harder difficulties in just increasing the Zed's damage and health. In Killing Floor 2, not only do the enemies gain larger stats, they also get new behaviors. 
For one, they'll close the gap faster. Clots will sprint instead of walking. Stalkers become the fastest enemy in the game, and sometimes flesh pounds will spawn in their charging rage. They'll also use defensive tactics to help close that gap. Cokehead clots and stalkers will dodge and roll like a competitive FromSoft enthusiast. Gorefasts and Gorefiends will block their faces nearly every time you try to shoot them in the head, and can block while running. Bloats, too, will defend their faces, and will puke while dashing if you get too close. Some Zeds gain new attacks as well. Stalkers will use more complicated jumping attacks so that they're harder to hit. Husks become more of a threat at close range, gaining a flamethrower to use on you, as well as deciding to blow themselves up next to you much more often. On top of all of this, the harder the difficulty, the more often you'll see elite enemies. I often hear people complain about game design when it comes to difficulty increases, so I find Killing Floor 2's way of doing it very refreshing and worth pointing out. The game does have its flaws, though, but everything I would consider a flaw about this game is sort of outside the core gameplay itself that makes it so fun. For one, the story is completely unimportant, and you would never find out about it through the gameplay itself. It's the kind of story you find out through reading the wiki. Basically, the Patriarch used, like, Rick and Morty technology to turn his son into a bunch of zombie clones, some bullshit, doesn't matter. My other gripe is that despite all the characters having unique voice lines and a dialogue wheel, they just don't match the charm of Killing Floor 1. Killing Floor 1 only had two voice actors for all the characters, but the lines were extremely memorable. My friends and I still quote them at each other to this day. I need a heal. Someone patch me up! I'm hurt! Someone heal me! Jesus, I'm bleeding like a stuck pig! Where's the bloody crack when you want one? That bloody well hurt! I want drugs! Now! Additionally, with the dialogue, the character dialogue you hear from the chat wheel is not the same that others hear. The voice line that the traitor or the boss plays is not the same that others hear. I do not like it when games do this, especially co-op games. This is a really personal gripe, just for me, because I like bonding over the voice lines in co-op games and sharing them with friends, laughing about them, or questioning what the hell they just said. But if what a character just said made you laugh, and you want to share that moment of fun with your friends, you have to go through the secret KF2 minigame of imitating the voice line with noticeably worse delivery to give your team a vague idea of what even happened, and by then the moment is lost. But ultimately, these are all aesthetics on top of the heart of what makes the game so good. Killing Floor 2 has a very special place in my heart. The game has its flaws, but the foundation of the gameplay loop is rock solid. And boy, does it make me solid. The variety of perks and how they interact with the variety of enemies would have been enough on its own. They also made the gunplay feel amazing. The reloads are beautiful, and the animation on the guns as they fire is especially good looking during Zed time. Learning how the different perks can form a cohesive team with each person focusing on different enemies gives a fun strategic experience. And on higher difficulties, you adapt to the Zed's change in behavior, a more satisfying experience of difficulty scaling than simply increasing their health and damage as other games do. All these things make Killing Floor 2 an intense, gore-filled, action-packed, meat grinder of an experience. An experience that I cannot get enough of. I hope you feel the same. Thanks very much everyone for watching this far, and a special thank you to my shady cabal of Vidya elites and Vidya enjoyers. Your untraced blood money funds the production of these videos. I assure you it will not go to waste. I love you all very much. Thanks again, and see you next time.